Okay, uh, we're going to go off here to uh, chapter four. Uh, so this would be the start of exam two material, yeah? So exam one should be coming up on Wednesday, I hope. Remember to write that exam, I guess, before Wednesday, and then we'll take it. All right, so in this chapter, we're going to talk about, uh, so we went to chapter 10, we're coming back to chapter four. We're going to really talk about the atom, and up front here, we're going to talk about uh, some really important sort of experiments that help us understand uh, really the nature of the atom and sort of what it is. Uh, later on, we'll talk about uh, some other properties of atoms, like what atomic number is, number, and all those type of things. So let's get started. Bless you. So first off, we talked about a couple of things uh, in some previous chapters. And one of the things we talked about was the idea of what a compound was. And remember, the compound uh, is always contains the same ratio of elements that are present. And what makes a compound, again, different than a molecule that we talked about was the idea that you need at least two or more different elements involved uh, in order for it to be a compound. Remember, for a molecule, you essentially just need two or more atoms involved. It could be the same or different. Uh, but for a compound, you do need uh, two or more elements there. So the way we express compounds uh, and molecules are with chemical formula. And a reminder that when we do look at a chemical formula, uh, we use subscripts. And those subscripts always go to the guy to the left. Uh, so that would be two atoms of hydrogen. Pretty much in chemistry, if we have one of something, uh, we really don't write it. Uh, so if you do not see anything there, uh, it pretty much means that we have one of those things. And again, always goes to the guy to the left there. So here we would have two atoms of hydrogen, uh, one atom of oxygen. And no matter where you get your water, it will always basically have that ratio of hydrogen to oxygen. It will also have really the same sort of ratio of mass in terms of hydrogen to oxygen. Again, since oxygen is about 16 grams, hydrogen is about one. Uh, for every uh, one gram of hydrogen, you'll have about eight grams of oxygen that would be present. Same thing if we had something like N2H4, that would be two nitrogens and four hydrogen atoms uh, would be present in this particular case. Now, when we write those uh, symbols or formulas, Again, we always use the chemical symbols. Uh, chemical symbols, as you can see from the periodic table, are usually either one letter or two letter uh, sort of symbols. And if it is one letter, by the way, it is capitalized always. And if it is two letters, the first letter should always be capitalized. The second one should not. Uh, so for example, we had something like CO versus CO. This capital C, uh, lowercase o, is cobalt, which is an element. Uh, capital C, capital O, means carbon monoxide, which is not an element, so very different as well. So always when you uh, write formulas or symbols, you want to make sure that you do uh, only the first one capital, second one lowercase, because uh, you might be writing something that you are not intending uh, in this particular case. So uh, again here, this would mean that there's one uh, carbon, two oxygen atoms, one nitrogen, three hydrogens, and in the case of carbon monoxide, it would be one carbon and one oxygen atom uh, that would be present in this particular case. All right, so let's take a look at these here. I should take a second and write the chemical formula for each of these. A molecule contains six carbon atoms, six hydrogens, half as many calcium as chlorines, and equal numbers of sodium, nitrogen, and three times the amount of oxygen. Okay, let's take a look. Uh, so here, uh, six carbon atoms and six hydrogen atoms. So once again, carbon is C. Uh, and again, the six should go to the lower right of it. And H for hydrogen and six there. A compound that has half as many calcium atoms as chlorine. Uh, so calcium is capital C, lowercase a. So if I have one of those, I would probably need two of those guys. And again, that would be one chlorine and okay, one calcium and two chlorines. And lastly here, uh, we got equal numbers of sodium, which is Na, nitrogen, which is N, and three times the amount of oxygen, little sodium in this particular case. Any questions on any of those there? Okay. 
Okay, so we're going to talk about atomic theory and sort of really the understanding of the atom. And what we're going to talk about is sort of important experiments that led us to understanding the atom, uh, which does contain, as we will talk about, protons, which are positively charged, electrons, which are negatively charged, and neutrons, uh, which have no charge. So as we go through this, we'll talk about, like I said, some different experiments that sort of study some of the different parts of the atom. Uh, and as we go through it, I'll sort of mention, you know, what you should definitely know uh, and what came out of those things. So first off, uh, a lot of uh, sort of the early, early understanding of atoms uh, was done by philosophers. They were thought to be very small, indivisible particles, atomos, uh, which are sort of indestructible sort of uncuttable type of particles and several things became really known as a result of that and clear to uh, scientists in the 18th century they know that most natural materials are mixtures of pure substances as we talked about a pure substance can be either an element or a compound and the law of composition as we just sort of mentioned a little bit ago uh, means that you'll always have the same composition of a compound regardless of where it comes from. So as was the case with uh, water, as I mentioned, again, uh, oxygen, 16 grams. Uh, there's two hydrogens, each at one gram each, which is two grams. So really, no matter where you find your water, really the composition by mass will always be the same. In terms of elements, you should always have about eight grams of oxygen for of hydrogen that is there. And that's what sometimes referred to as the law of composition. They're always sort of come to in the sort of whole number of ratios uh, where you have sort of the same ratio of mass of these elements that come together. So kind of the first uh, idea of the atom and some of the important parts of the atom was done by a guy named Dalton. He came up with Dalton's atomic theory. And it is a theory, as we talked about before, which means, as we will talk about, not all parts of it were found to be sort of correct. Uh, but some parts are definitely correct. You do need to know, as we'll go through it, sort of the important parts of it, and we'll talk about it in just a second. But Dalton was an interesting uh, sort of person. He kept records of the weather every day of his life. Uh, he never married, surprisingly. And probably the most important thing to know is, right, he did go bowling on Thursdays because that's definitely going to show up probably on the exam. Um, so don't put Friday, Cosmic Sundays. Or anything like that. It's going to be Thursday. Um, but really what he's sort of known for, besides, I guess, the bowling on Thursdays, is uh, he had a precise sort of definition of what we sort of call atoms. And let's take a look at some of the important parts of Dalton's atomic theory. He said a couple of things here. He said that, that basically elements are composed of extremely small particles they called atoms. This idea as well that they're sort of indestructible type of particles. He said that all atoms of a given element are identical. They have the same size, the same mass, and chemical properties. He also said that when you have atoms of different elements, uh, they will be different from each other. He visualized uh, compounds as basically being composed of atoms of more than one element. He said that basically a chemical reaction only involves the rearranging and reattachment, uh, if you will, of these atoms. Uh, we, again, don't lose anything along the way. So that's, you know, sort of the idea of the law of conservation of mass. When we have a chemical reaction, as we will talk about, it only involves really bonds uh, breaking and bonds making, as we talked about in the energy chapter. And because that is not at the heart of what makes something a particular element, the electrons, uh, it doesn't involve any type of elements changing. So whatever elements you start with or whatever elements that you basically will end with. Now, there's certain parts of this that are not so correct. And one of the ones where the idea of the atoms being indestructible Um, the idea of in a nuclear reaction, for example, uh, we don't have conservation of the elements. You actually change it from one sort of element to another. So uh, that doesn't hold true. 
And really the main thing as well that is not correct is this part of it, that all atoms of a given element are identical. And the presence of what are known as isotopes uh, basically disproves that. As we will talk about later on in this chapter, an isotope is really the same element, uh, but it has a different mass. Uh, so obviously if it has a different mass, it is not identical to the other element as well. So although they are the same elements, they don't have the exact same property. So those two things are two parts of Dalton's atomic theory, which isn't holding true for the indestructible part. And really that all atoms are basically the same, have the same properties if they are the same element. Again, isotopes, same element, but have different properties. They have different masses. Any questions? You need to know these sort of points here from Dalton's atomic theory. So this is also how Dalton sort of pictured com, uh, compounds coming together here as basically different combinations of even the same elements will give you different sort of properties. So although all three of these guys are basically combinations of nitrogens and oxygens, because of the numbers of nitrogens or oxygens that are present, how they are bound together uh, will give these guys different properties. So even if you have sort of the same elements involved in a compound, uh, the way that they're connected, how many there are, their geometry and all that kind of stuff plays a role into their actual properties. Uh, so again, they may have very different properties, even though they are composed of the same type of elements. So let's talk a little about the structure of the atom itself. So based on Dalton's atomic theory, there were a couple of things that were thought to occur. Uh, basically, the atom is the basic unit of any element that could come into chemical combination. And a lot of investigation and experiments realized that although atoms are extremely small particles themselves, uh, they're made up of even smaller particles. And that is what we were just talking about. And they are sometimes referred to as subatomic particles. And those are our protons, our electrons, and our neutrons. And again, one more time, protons are positively charged. Electrons have basically a negative one charge. And again, our neutrons there have no charge, as we talked about there a second ago. And we're going to talk now about sort of uh, some experiments that sort of helped us understand a little bit more about each of these particles and also perhaps where these particles are located uh, within the atom. So I think we're going to start with electrons. And really, a couple of important things about sort of the idea of electrons is the idea of opposites attract. And a lot of experiments, as we will talk about, and I think we might even have a slide, but I'll talk about it now. A lot of experiments really took advantage of the idea of sort of opposites attract, an electrostatic attraction. And they, a lot of them will use some type of beams that have charges. So sometimes they use a lot of radioactive type particles. Uh, so for example, there are alpha particles, which are positively charged radioactive particles. Uh, there are beta particles. Uh, which are negatively charged sort of particles. And there's gamma rays, which are radioactive particles uh, that have basically no charge. So obviously now, you know, they basically kind of symbolize, you know, uh, like kind of like a proton and an electron and neutrons in terms of their charges. And the advantage of using something like this and the idea of using something like, for example, an electrical field, uh, you can have a pretty good idea as to what the charge of particles are as to how they're affected by, say, an electrical field. So if you had an electrical field or you had sort of a positive plate and a negative plate, and if you shot a particle kind of through this electrical field and it kind of bent up towards the positive plate, we would know that that particle probably has what type of charge? should have a negative charge, right, because it's attracted sort of to the positive place. And if you shot that particle and it kind of curved down to the negative side, it, we would know that it would probably have a positive type of charge associated with it. And obviously, if you shot something and it just kind of went straight, 
uh, really wasn't affected by a magnetic field, uh, it would have no charge. A, uh, our electrical field. A magnetic field will work similar. It has a North Pole, South Pole, which sort of does sort of a similar type of effect on those type of particles as well. So a lot of these sort of experiments, and some of them relied, uh, when they were studying sort of the nature of the atom, relied upon sort of these sort of radioactive particles, uh, but just really that basic idea of opposites attract to see sort of what is happening. Yes. What's that? An atom is uh, atom is basically the basic representation of an element and is made up of smaller particles like protons, electrons, and neutrons. A particle like this, for example, like a beta particle, for example, is, is really an electron. So it's kind of just like the electron. Actually, an alpha particle is actually helium. So it's actually that element. It's made up of all the stuff that's in helium, stuff like that. So... Um, but in general, an atom, again, is basically made up of smaller particles and the representation of element. All right, so let's talk about really the electron and really the first sort of understanding of the electron and sort of how it works uh, really came about with the cathode ray tube, which is sometimes referred to as the CRT. And a cathode ray tube uh, basically will shoot negatively charged particles like electrons. So... This little beam here is basically composed of these negatively charged sort of particles. And obviously it would be headed this way as we have a positive sort of field over here. Negative field in the back, so it's going to go away from the negative. <clears throat> excuse me. And head towards the positive in this case. A lot of times what people will do is put like a little fluorescent material there on that side. And they could actually see sort of where the beam is hitting as it kind of goes through there. You may be familiar with a CRT tube, maybe. I don't know. If you have a, ever seen an older TV, like older, older TV, like they used to have them on the floor type TVs, you know, that has like the big back type TVs, not plasmas or flat screens or anything like that. Those are CRT tubes, old computer monitors. You've ever seen those as well uh, that, you know, they kind of have like the big back type of computer monitor in the back there. Uh, those were CRT type of uh, monitors. They have those type of tubes in there. Years ago, when you had your uh, TV, it was broken. You called the TV repairman to your house, right? He'd open up the back and play with the picture tube, which is sort of like this is. You didn't run down to Costco and just grab a new one, throw it in the truck, I suppose, and go home with it. Um, but uh, if you've ever seen any of those, those are basically uh, CRT type tubes. So the cathode ray tube, as I mentioned before, will shoot these negatively charged particles, which are basically representative of electrons. So this is definitely a tool that was used to explore electrons. Uh, and as I mentioned, it has this stream of negatively charged particles, which can hit the other side and sort of fluoresce. I think we have a, and there's our idea there of what we were talking about, our differences there in our particles. And again, uh, sort of what we talked about our electrical field and how that kind of bends and also again a magnetic field will affect it kind of similar as well so here's the thing that will play maybe this one might play this is a cathode oh, ray or crooks too it produces a beam of electrons as do television sets and computer monitors a luminescent material has been painted on part of the inner surface of the tube it produces light when electrons strike it. The electrons originate at the cathode of the tube. The long, thin object entering the scene is a bar magnet. The position of the bright spot on the screen can be changed by moving the magnet near the beam of electrons. This process is analogous to adjusting a television picture. So as you can see, that beam of negatively charged particles is affected by a magnet, which is a magnetic field. And again, it, you're seeing the spot there because they have a fluorescent sort of material at the end of it. So that is sort of like a cathode ray tube that they use to explore electrons. And one of the people that did a lot of experiments with a cathode ray tube, there he is staring at it, I suppose, is uh, J.J. Thompson. So one of the first experiments that you do need to be aware of is J.J. Thompson. He did work with the cathode ray tube. And... He was able to see the effects of electrical and magnetic forces on these negatively charged particles. And the major thing that came out of Thompson's sort of experiment was he was able to figure out the charge to mass of an electron. So uh, 
Thompson was able to figure out the charge of mass of an electron, which is that number there, minus 1.76 times 10 to the 8 C over G. C is a Coulomb, which is a charge, electrical charge unit, and G is grams, so charge to mass, right? Grams is mass, so that's the charge to mass of an electron. So by using these cathode ray tubes, doing some calculations and effects of electrical and magnetic fields sort of on them, he was able to come up with this sort of charge to mass of an electron. And this was sort of an important understanding of electrons. And along came the next sort of important experiment that involved electrons. And this was one that was done by Milligan. And Milligan did what is referred to as the oil drop experiment. And what Milligan did was he sent basically uh, oil droplets into this container here, this chamber. And basically, the oil drop, if you will, would want to fall based on gravity. Uh, once it kind of came through the chamber, he had an electrical field here that he was able to really adjust the electrical field. And as it was dropping, it would gain a charge. He was able to adjust the electrical field in such a way that uh, basically the oil droplet would just sort of hang there. So when it go up, when it go down, he was able to really sort of dial in uh, the electrical field. And what he was able to come out of that... He was able to come from that was basically the charge of an electron. So he was able to, I do, I guess so. There we go. So that oil droplet came there. He was able to adjust that electrical field. And again, just really kind of have it suspended there. And from that, he was able to figure out the charge of an electron, which is this guy. So he was able to figure out the actual charge of an electron. So those two sort of experiments were really valuable in terms of understanding the electron more. We had Thompson who figured out the uh, charge to mass of an electron. We had Milligan who did the oil drop experiment, was able to figure out the charge of it. And using both of these experiments together, you are able to basically determine the mass of an electron. So what came out of sort of these two experiments were you could actually figure out the mass of the electron by dividing the charge by the charge to mass. And the result was we found that the electron had a mass here of 9.09 .09 times 10 to the minus 28 grams. So these two experiments were really important in that understanding of sort of the charge of an electron and also the mass of an electron. Is that a large number or a small number? It was a really small number, right? It's like 28 places to the left and add some zeros. Add like 27 zeros. So the first two things obviously you need to know is the study of the electron was aided by the cathode ray tube done by Thompson, who came up with the charge to mass of an electron, followed by Milligan and his oil drop experiment, who was able to figure out the charge of an electron. And putting both of those experiments together, we were able to determine the actual mass of an electron. Any questions on that so far? <clears throat> so then that led us to the idea of protons and the nucleus. And as a result of these sort of experiments, a couple of things sort of were happening at this point. It was believed that the atom definitely contained electrons through these experiments that we just saw. And it was believed that they were electrically neutral, which means that if we know they have electrons already, and we know these electrons are negatively charged, that would mean that the atom must possess something that is also positively charged, right? To balance it out and be neutral. And around the last century, uh, the accepted model of the atom was one that was by Thompson. So Thompson came up with this idea of the model of the atom, and it's sometimes referred to as the plum pudding model, and basically what he said was the atom is basically this nice spear of positive charge. Just kind of spread out over it all. We have this nice spear of positive charge. And embedded inside the spear of positive charge, we have our electrons embedded inside. And he felt that most of the mass of the atom... Oops, of the mass of the atom uh, was the electrons. So plum pudding is like a 
putting sort of dessert with raisins in there. So it's kind of like the raisins are like the electrons. The pudding is sort of like the positive charge sort of spread out over it. And this was sort of the accepted model of the atom at this point. Uh, and as we will see, maybe not so long, uh, it was the model of the atom, but uh, this was really an early model of the atom. Here's a, probably a much prettier picture than what I drew there of it. Uh, but again, we have this positive charge really spread out over the entire sphere, electrons embedded inside. And again, most of the mass at this point uh, was believed to be those electrons. So this was really the accepted model of the atom. But as we've talked about before, sometimes things need to be revisited. And really the next major experiment that really helped us revisit this model of the atom and helped us have a better understanding of the atom uh, was the gold foil experiment. And the gold foil experiment was done by Rutherford along with Geiger, like the Geiger counter for radioactive type stuff and Marston. And what they did is they took uh, alpha particles and they shot it at pieces of gold foil. So a reminder, as we talked about there, alpha particles were these positively charged radioactive particles and they shot it at pieces of gold metal and others and wanted to see what would happen. Now, when they did this experiment, they were actually kind of surprised about what they saw. So the idea here was based off of sort of the plum pudding model where we have this positive charge spread out, we got our electrons embedded inside there. And they were gonna take these alpha particles and they're gonna basically shoot it at it here. So they're gonna take these alpha particles, which are positively charged radioactive particles and shoot it at it. And what they expected to happen was it would go through with some deflection, right? Cause they're shooting positively charged particles at it. It's going through something that's positive. So there's gonna be a little bit of deflection as it goes through. They're heavy and they're moving really fast. So they're not gonna have a problem. So sort of like this, if this was my atom and it looks like a piece of paper now instead of circle, but and this was my positive charge sort of spread out all over uh, this paper here as my atom. If I held like this side of it and somebody held this side really tight and we shot like a pin right at it, it probably would be able to pop through, right? But a little bit of deflection as it would kind of pop through one side to the other as it came through. And that's sort of what they expected to happen uh, because of the way the Plum Cody model was. Uh, and they were actually really surprised that that's actually not what sort of happened. What they actually saw happen, in a second, we'll get to your 1910. And what they actually saw happen was most of the atoms, or most of the alpha particles went through with no problem. So they were undeflected. So most of them just fell through no problem. They were undeflected. But what they did see was every so often, you know, what they saw was most just on a, sent through. But every so often, they would see ones get bounced off at these really large angles, uh, which was really surprising to them. So I would ask you, if they went through with no problem, what did they hit? Nothing, right? So if I threw my pin this way with nothing in the way, it's just going to go right through, no problem, right? Now, when they did see them bounce off at these really, really large angles, that means that when I shot these alpha particles, which are positively charged, in order for it to bounce off at a really, really large angle, it had to hit something that was very, what type of charge? Positively charged, right? Because if it hit something negative, it's just going to stop, right? It's going to be really attracted, right? So in order for it to bounce off at really large angles, it had to hit something very, very densely positive. So as we will see here in this video in just a second and talk about they had to sort of revisit the idea of uh, the atom and sort of where that positive charge was sort of located. Now we'll get to your 1910. Maybe. In 1910, Everford and his co-workers were studying the angles at which alpha particles were scattered as they passed through a thin gold foil. So you can see in the back there, most are just going through no problem. However, a few were found to be scattered at large angles some even back in the direction from which they had come. 
This meant that they had collided with an object much more massive than the alpha particles themselves, yet so small that only a few alpha particles encountered them. This atomic level view shows what is happening. Most of the atom is occupied by the low mass electron. The nucleus is small and massive. When an alpha particle encounters a nucleus, it is scattered at a large angle. In 1910, Rutherford... So, basically what they thought of was, well, to sort of explain what they had, uh, they obviously had a sort of abandon, as we'll talk about, the plum pudding model, where we had all the positive charge spread out all over. So, if we took the same sort of example, my paper being the positive charge says being spread out, I take my positive charge, right, and I... Fold it once, fold it twice, maybe, three times. What do they say? How many times can you fold before you can't fold anymore? Seven. I don't like that. So, all right, we put all my positive charges are being spread out over, really concentrated here, right? So when I would shoot my pen at it, right, it is going to reflect it off, right? It's not going to be able to go through. It's going to bounce off. So that's sort of what came out of this really important experiment. They went in thinking the plum pudding model was correct. Based on what they saw that most of those alpha particles had really no problem, they went straight through, which meant, as we were just talking about, they really didn't hit anything. Nothing got in their way. But also, the most important thing as well was they did see every so often these guys bouncing off at really large angles, which, again, the only thing that could really do that is something that was really, really positive, which made us understand that the positive charge wasn't really spread out all over the entire atom. It was really centralizedly located in a very specific area of the atom, uh, which basically is known as the nucleus, as we'll, we'll talk about. So going in is that's what they sort of thought would happen there on the left. They would be able to punch through that positive jello, if you will, uh, and have some deflection. But really what they saw is what's on the right there. Most sell through no problem. Only those ones that hit that really positive core uh, allowed those alpha particles to be bounced off at really, really large angles. So what we had to do was kind of take the uh, plum pudding model and kind of get rid of it and come up with really the new model of the atom, which is really the current model of the atom, which is the atom is actually mostly empty space. And that empty space, as we'll talk about, is pretty much where our electrons are basically flying around. Yeah. Very densely positive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the other one was very positive, but the difference was in the plum pudding model, it was spread out over the entire sphere, right? So it's kind of like uh, the Play-Doh type stuff, right? You pour it really tight right on a ball. It's hard to like put your finger through it, right? But if you take that Play-Doh and you spread it out, right, it starts to get very thin, right, as it gets spread out all over. And you could just very easily poke your finger through it, right, as it's very spread out and stuff like that. So that's sort of the idea of, of that. In the plum pudding model, there was a lot of positive charge, but it was very spread out all over and not very sort of thick, if you were, or densely packed. And that's why they assume the alpha particles would be able to punch through because of that. But in order to make it really bounce off, it had to hit something pretty hard, positively densely cored, uh, positively charged. Yeah, so it will vary. It will vary depending on the atom as to how much positive charge there is in there. Uh, but uh, we'll also see why, uh, even if there's not a lot of protons in there, also why... Uh, in a second, uh, it would have an effect even like that as well. All right, so basically they said atoms was mostly empty space. That's pretty much where our electrons are flying around. It has that dense positive core, uh, which was known as the nucleus. And as we will later talk about here, uh, basically what's in the nucleus are our protons, which are positively charged. And about 1930, neutrons were discovered sort of there as well that have no charge. Uh, on them as well. So that is where those guys are. Now, another really important distinction between the plum pudding model and this current model of the atom was most of the mass of the atom was actually the nucleus. 
So the nucleus, unlike the plum pudding model, where they said it was the electron that was most of the mass of the atom, it is going to be the nucleus is going to be most of the mass of the atom. And we'll also see in a couple of slides why that is as well. So Rutherford, super important experiment, uh, basically kind of disproved the model, earlier model of the atom of the plum pudding model uh, based on the results that occurred uh, where they saw those alpha particles go through no problem and bounce off at these really large angles, uh, helped us sort of really have a better understanding of where those sort of positive charges are located, which is in this nucleus, which is in the center, and densely positive uh, rather than being spread out all over the atom. Any questions on that? So clearly you need to know Rutherford's experiment, what it was, what it did, what they thought was going to happen going in, and what they happened afterwards, and obviously how that changed our model from the plum pudding model to obviously the current model of the atom. Any questions on that there? Yeah. So here's just a little table of some of the important experiments we've talked about up until this point and sort of what came out of it. So this is like a little summary table of some of the important things uh, that came out of it. And obviously most of that stuff you should know as we talked about it here. So that does bring us to protons. So as we talked about uh, this sort of existence of protons was sort of discovered, if you will, uh, by Rutherford's experiment, or at least where they're located in the nucleus. And they are positively charged particles in the nucleus, and they have a mass of 1.67252 times 10 to the minus 24 grams. And that is actually important because if you think about the electron, which was something like 909 times 10 to the minus 28 grams, which one's a larger number? The proton one, right? To the one minus 24. So when you have a negative exponent, as we talked about, the smaller number is the larger number. Uh, so it's about 1,800 times heavier than an electron. So any proton that is present in the nucleus is about 1,800 times heavier than any pro uh, than any electron that is present. And that also helps us understand that most of the mass of the atom would be made up of the nucleus because in the nucleus is where you find those protons. So uh, that helps us understand why the nucleus is most of the mass of the atom because obviously it has these much At this stage, uh, basically the understanding of the atom was uh, the nucleus comprises most of the mass of the atom uh, because it does have those protons. And later here, we'll talk about it has, it has neutrons as well. Uh, the typical atomic rate is about 100 picometers. Uh, you can think of the atom as like the Superdome, a uh, big football stadium if you've ever been in New Orleans. Very steep, very steep if you see it in the seat like a big yard line, like a marble and stuff like that. So very big open space, very smallly part of the atom, but very dense part of the atom. Important part of the atom is the nucleus. So um, a lot of space, empty space for those electrons to be flying around in. Now, we do have obviously our nucleus here, which is positively charged overall. We have our electrons, which are negatively charged flying around. Is there an attraction between the electrons and the nucleus? There is, they have that same opposite attraction, right? They got these negatively charged electrons attracted to the positively charged uh, nucleus. As we will talk about as well, by the way, electrons do not travel in pretty circles or anything like that. They travel randomly about the atom uh, in a really random sort of pathway. So they don't travel in pretty circles or anything like that. Uh, but there is really an attraction between the electrons in that empty space and the nucleus. That's what basically holds them there. So they don't fly away, basically, in most cases. It is also, as we'll talk about in different chapters, why certain electrons are involved in bonding and other ones are not. There are certain electrons that are much closer to the nucleus and held a lot tighter that there's no chance that you're going to get any of those to be involved in bonding. But there's much further away nuclear, uh, much further away electrons, which are referred to as valence electrons, uh, which are not held as tightly. They're still held, but not held as tightly. And those are the ones that are involved in bonding. So the location of where these electrons are in certain proximity to the nucleus in terms of their energy levels, 
also plays a role in whether or not they may participate in bonding or not participate in bonding as well. And we'll talk about that, obviously, when we get to the bonding chapter. So the last sort of particle, which is the neutron, was actually not discovered until about 1932 uh, by James Chadwick. And there was always this idea that there was some other particle within that nucleus. And it was in 1932 where he did a lot of work with uh, beryllium and alpha particles. And what he saw come off were a lot of particles that resemble gamma rays. And as I mentioned earlier, gamma rays are essentially uh, no charge, pure radiation. So they have no charge sort of particles. And later experiments show that they consist of these neutral particles, uh, which they call neutrons. And it has a mass of 1.67495 times 10 to the minus 24. The reason they come out that far is if you compare that number to the number for the protons, you will see that it is actually the neutrons that just slightly edges out the protons in terms of mass. So actually out of those three particles, protons, electrons, and neutrons, it is the neutron that is the heaviest, followed very closely by the proton, and about 1,800 or so times less massive are the electrons. Uh, so that is also why, again, coming back to our nucleus, which has both protons and neutrons, each of these guys in here are about 1,840 times heavier than any electron flying around. So that also sort of uh, reinforces the idea that most of the mass of the atom is actually the nucleus, which contains these very heavy sort of particles in there uh, versus the electron, which is actually a much lighter sort of particle. I would say for our particular class, I don't know as you continue your journey or not, but you might want to know these masses. But uh, I, for our particular class, you need to know uh, which one is the heaviest, which one is the lightest. Yes, uh, I probably won't ask you the exact number. Don't be surprised if they do as you continue on in your journey. But uh, so, uh, but for us, you just need to know uh, again, uh, sort of which one is the heaviest, which one is the lightest, and that type of stuff. Obviously, you also need to know their charges and where they're located within the atom. So inside the nucleus, protons and neutrons, and flying around again in a pretty random manner outside of the nucleus, we have our electrons. Any questions on the atom there? <clears throat> and there's our summary of those numbers. So again, I'm not going to require you to know the exact numbers, although they might expect you to maybe to know them as you continue on. But you do need to know, again, like I said, which one's the heaviest and lightest of those three. All right. So then let's talk a little bit about modern concept of the atom. This is sort of a cross section, if you will, of sort of what the atom is. Uh, this is our nucleus. Again, you can see very small relative to the size of the atom, even though the atom is relatively small itself. Uh, this sort of uh, smear you can kind of see there is uh, what we'll talk about in later chapters. This is what it's sometimes referred to as an electron density map. Uh, the darker color is a higher probability of finding electrons as you sort of fan out to a lighter color, which you might be able to see some of the difference there as you go from here to here. Uh, that's a lower probability of finding an electron in those particular locations. So once again, we can see the darkest part is actually near the nucleus, which would make sense. Again, that's positively charged. That's gonna attract them. Once again, that's the empty space. We don't know exactly how the electrons are traveling. They are moving pretty randomly about that empty space. So one of the important things is uh, that the chemistry of all atoms basically comes from its electrons. And they're involved uh, when atoms come and collide. And if you think about it, just with their location, we have basically the electrons on the outside of the atom, which means when two atoms come together, the electrons are pretty much the first ones to say hello to each other because they're on the outside. And that is pretty much the only thing that is involved in actual chemical reactions is, again, those electrons and bonds being made and broken. Really, one of the important aspects of why we have sort of the conservation of elements, as we'll talk about, is... The idea that we don't really touch anything in the nucleus. So nothing in the nucleus is pretty much involved in any type of normal chemical reaction. In a nuclear reaction, that's all you touch is the nucleus. But in a normal chemical reaction, which we we'll talk about in this class and your next class, 
Uh, it's all about just the bonds and the electrons. So let's talk about some other properties of atoms, and this is atomic number, mass number, and isotopes. Let's start with atomic number. Atomic number is the number of protons. It is also sometimes abbreviated with a Z. And it is the number of protons that you find in the nucleus of an atom. In a neutral atom, the atomic number will also tell you the number of electrons. So if you think about an atom, right, it has protons which are positively charged, has electrons which are negatively charged, has neutrons which have no charge. Which means if I know the atomic number, which is the number of protons, the only other thing in that atom that's negative is electrons. In order for it to be neutral, you would need the same number of electrons as you have protons, right? Same number of positives and same number of negatives give you zero when you add them together, right, in terms of the overall charge. It is also really important that if you're asked this question of what is the definition of an atomic number, it is just the number of protons. So sometimes people mistakenly say the number of protons and electrons. So that is not the definition. The actual definition is just the protons. But if you are talking about a neutral atom, it will tell you also the number of electrons. So that's a really important thing. Where or where can I find my atomic number? Well, that is my periodic table. And that would be the number right there above the symbol on the periodic table. So all the numbers above the symbols are the atomic numbers and will tell you the number of protons there are. So for example, that we got down there, if we look at nitrogen, it is lucky number seven right there. And that tells us that in a neutral nitrogen atom, I would have seven protons, which are positive. And because it's neutral, I got to have the exact same number of electrons and I would have seven electrons. When you look at the periodic table, which is here, or there, are there any number up on top that repeats? There is not any number up on top that repeats. Every single element has its own unique atomic number, which means if you know the atomic number or you know the number of protons, which is essentially the same thing, you know exactly what element you're talking about. Or if you know the element you're dealing with, you could go to the periodic table and just look at the number on top and you will know how many protons that it should have. So that number on top, for example, I would never find a nitrogen atom with uh, five protons because five protons is boron. Yeah, it's boron. Uh, so five protons is boron, right? Uh, and that is, again, the number on top. So that's really important is that atomic number uh, is really important in terms of what element it is. That should also tell you out of protons, electrons, and neutrons, which one is the most important in terms of what element? The protons. Yeah, the protons are the most important thing. And that is why when we we're just talking about in a chemical reaction, that deals with only electrons, not the nucleus. Because we don't touch the nucleus, we don't change the number of protons. So the elements stay in a normal chemical reaction because we only deal with electrons. Another important number is the mass number. And the mass number is abbreviated with an A. And it is actually the number of protons and neutrons there are. So the mass number is your number of protons plus your number of neutrons. Your atomic number, as we just talked about, is actually the number of protons. So actually, if you use both of those things together, if you take the mass number and you subtract it from the atomic number, the only thing that's left is the number of neutrons. So you could actually calculate the number of neutrons by taking the mass number minus the atomic number. When you calculate those things, or you're asked to find those things, which is the mass number, the atomic number, the number of protons, electrons, and neutrons, they all should be positive whole numbers. So that brings us to the final question of the day here, which is when I look at the periodic table, is that the mass number? The answer is no, it is not the mass number. That is what we call the atomic mass, as we will talk about. The reason you know it's not the mass number is the definition I just said is they all need to be whole numbers. Yeah. 
and that clearly is not a whole number. And pretty much all of them on the periodic table there are not whole numbers. The only number that you can find on the periodic table is the atomic number, which is the top number. The bottom number is not the mass number. What confuses people a lot of times is it's a number very close to your calculated mass number a lot of times. So don't be the person that puts that number down for the mass number. That is not the way you calculate it. You will have enough information given to you to actually calculate the mass number, the neutrons and the protons and stuff like that. So only the atomic number can be found on the periodic table. Like I said before, you'll be able to figure out the protons and neutrons and all that and mass number from the information given to you. Any questions on that there? All right, let's let.